A whole colony of Vikings vanishing into thin air? Mysterious archaeological finds, the most widely witnessed UFO event in history. These are some of the strangest, most mysterious events in history. The North settled in Greenland around the 10th century, creating a colony that lasted for about 500 years. But then, in the late 15th century, they vanished. Now, it's not like it was uncommon for people to relocate back then, but what was strange about this was that they'd left behind a lot of their supplies and belongings. It was like they just evaporated. Historians and archaeologists still haven't come up with a clear answer. But there are theories. One is that environmental changes made life too hard for them, forcing the settlers to leave. Another is that local Inuits may have raided the colony, killing or capturing the settlers, but there weren't any clear signs of an attack. Everything had been left in a pretty tidy manner. If the Inuit had raided the colony, there would have been signs of a struggle, but the, the site had been found neat and intact. There's also the theory that a plague in the late 15th century, which hit Iceland and Norway, left many farms empty, meaning the Greenland settlers might have returned to Europe to claim the abandoned land, but that doesn't make much sense either. I mean, the Vikings back home would have known that these guys had returned. There wouldn't be much of a mystery, would there? This is a very strange case. Saksai Waman is an impressive Incan fort built in the 1400s, just outside of Cusco, Peru. The fort is famous for its massive stone walls made from stones that each weigh around 100 to 120 tons. What's even more amazing though is how these stones fit together, which is perfectly. They also have these smooth finishes, almost like they were melted and then hardened again in a giant kiln. But back then, there was no way they could have had a kiln big enough to do something like that. Researchers have been trying to figure out how the Incas managed to mold these stones for years. Some think they might have used mirrors or glass to focus sunlight and heat the stones until they were soft enough to fit together, but there's no evidence of a method like that having been used. Others have theorized that the stones may have been rough at first and then natural fires partially melted them together, but tests have shown that regular fires don't really get hot enough to melt the stone. Here's a theory for you. Maybe the Incas had some kind of a deal with a race of stone carving aliens, but I had to do it. In Jordan and Syria, there are mysterious stone circles spread across the desert plains. Some of these circles are huge. The smallest is about 720 feet wide, and the largest is more than 1,450 feet across. They're all between three and five feet high, and none of them have any openings or entrances, which is strange because if they'd been used to, say, house animals, you'd think there'd be doors or gates. By that same token, they don't really seem to have been used as burial sites either. The circles are incredibly well formed though, almost perfectly round, which is surprising given how old they are. Archaeologists think they were built between 4500 BC and 2000 BC, a span of about 2500 years, which really doesn't narrow down their purpose much. Researchers believe there were once even more of these strange stone circles, but many have been destroyed as new towns and settlements were built. Scientists are still trying to figure out why they were used and who built them. There's also a strange circle of stones in Miami. In 1998, while preparing to build new condos in South Beach, developers came across something they'd never seen before. As they were tearing down old buildings and digging deep into the ground, they discovered a circle of 24 large holes, each filled with heavy limestone tablets. This discovery was so unusual that they had to call in archaeologists to investigate. The archaeologists found that these stones were arranged in a perfect circle, about 38 feet across. They also uncovered other ancient items like animal bones, shark teeth, and old axe heads made of basalt rock. After studying the area, the experts estimated that the Miami Circle was about 2,000 years old. The circle is believed to have been created by the Tequesta people, a tribe that lived in the region until the early 18th century. The Tequesta were known to be nomadic. Today, the Miami Circle sits right in the middle of the city. Researchers are still studying the site and the artifacts, but the purpose of the circle and even a lot about the Tequesta themselves 
it's still a mystery. All right, this story is one of the wildest and most mysterious tales from World War II. So in October of 1943 at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, the Navy was working on a top secret project to make ships invisible to enemy radar. The ship at the center of all this was the USS Eldridge. The story goes that they were using some kind of high tech equipment involving powerful electromagnetic fields. When they turned on this equipment, something bizarre happened. The ship disappeared. Not just off radar, but physically vanished from sight. Some say it was teleported to Norfolk, Virginia, and then brought back to Philadelphia in just a few minutes. But the strangest part is what happened to the crew. When the ship reappeared, some sailors had been fused into the ship's metal. Others had gone missing entirely. The tale first came about in 1955 when a man named Carl Allen, who claimed to be a witness, sent a series of letters to a US Navy research organization and a UFO researcher. Of course, the Navy denies that the experiment ever took place, and the letters are often shocked up to a very creative hoax. But there is a small chance something really did happen that day. I mean, hey, who knows? None of us were there. The story of John Zagras is often referenced as one of the eeriest examples of an alternate reality crossing over into our own, at least in some versions of the story, anyway. Yeah, this one falls into the realm of urban legends, but it is a pretty great story all the same. The story goes that in 1954, at Tokyo's Haneda Airport, a man handed over his passport, leaving the officials in utter confusion. His passport was from a country called Torrid. If you're wondering what Torrid is, well, it doesn't exist. They looked at the man, and he seemed completely normal. He was well-dressed and polite, but he insisted that Torrid was a real country located between France and Spain, and he was shocked when the officials told him that that place just didn't exist. The man had other documents too, like a driver's license and bank statements, all from this place called Torrid. His passport even had stamps showing he had traveled to other countries before. The officials were just completely baffled. They checked maps and globes, and they were like, are we just crazy? But no, there was no Torrid. They put him in a nearby hotel while they investigated further, and they posted guards outside his room just to make sure he didn't leave. But when they went in to check on him the next morning, he disappeared. The room was on a high floor, no balcony, and the guards swore they didn't see or hear anything strange during the night. His documents also disappeared, leaving no trace of the mysterious man from Torrid. No one could figure out where he came from or where he went. So where does John Zegras come into the picture? Well, there is a documented case of a foreign man being detained in Japan for identity fraud, but it's never been 100% verified if John Zegras' story spawned the legend of the Torrid Man or if his case was completely unrelated. All right, y'all know I love my cryptids and uh, these just might be the coolest cryptids I've ever heard of, neo-dinosaurs. I'd never heard about these till fairly recently. Uh, these are exactly what they sound like, sightings of dinosaurs in modern times. And yes, there have been multiple sightings of these things in the Amazon basin, in Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, and Brazil. The most common type of neo-dinosaur reported in the Amazon is a large, long-necked, amphibious animal that looks a lot like a sauropod. Then there are ones that look like a Monodons and less frequently bipedal reptiles similar to Allosaurus. There have been tracks discovered that look like dinosaur type footprints and actual sightings of the creatures themselves. If you can believe it, which most of you I'm sure can't, fair play. One of the famous tales of these creatures comes from the British archaeologist and explorer Percy Fawcett. That's the guy who claimed to have found the lost city of Z. He claimed to have found these three toed tracks in the forests of Brazil, and a friend of Fawcett claimed to have seen a large, long-necked reptile near the Brazil-Bolivia border. There were also reports of an iguanodon-like creature in Colombia in 1921, and a Brazilian named Alvaro Mosquito reported encountering a camptosaur-like animal on the shore of a swampy lake between the Purus River and the Juaro River. And even as recently as 1995, geology students in Brazil's Sincora Mountains reported seeing two large creatures about 30 feet long with eight foot necks and tails bathing in a river. Very 
bizarre. <laughs> and I can understand why some people may not believe this. I just think it's a really cool idea. One of the most awe-inspiring and well-documented UFO sightings came in 1997. It was March 13th in Arizona, a clear, starry night. People were just going about their usual business when out of nowhere, strange lights started to appear in the sky. And no, they were not stars. First, there was this V-shaped formation of five lights slowly gliding across the state. The lights were first spotted in the town of Henderson, Nevada, around 7.55 p.m. And from there, they made their way to Arizona, passing over Prescott and heading towards Phoenix. As the lights moved, more and more people saw them, hundreds, maybe even thousands looked up and saw this weird, silent, glowing formation. Some folks described it as a massive, solid object blocking out the stars as it passed. The police were flooded with reports. Phone lines were lighting up in news and radio stations, and the odd V-shaped craft wasn't the only one reported. A police officer in Paulden, Arizona would report seeing a cluster of orange-colored lights. And later, around 10 p.m., there were a number of reports in the Phoenix area of a row of brilliant lights hovering in the sky, or slowly falling. It later came out that the Air National Guard had been carrying out test flights that night, but people were skeptical, and till this day, people still don't buy the official explanation. As for why that is, well, we could do a whole video on this case, but essentially, the military said one of the light formations was a plane, and the other sets of lights were flares, and it just didn't look like that. The story of the Orang Medan is one of the creepiest and most mysterious sea tales out there. It all started in 1947, when a distress call came in from a Dutch freighter named the SS Orang Medan. The message, all officers, including the captain, are dead lying in chart room and bridge, possibly whole crew dead. Then there was some garbled Morse code, followed by the final words, I die, which has always creeped me out. Rescue ships were quickly sent to check things out. When they boarded the ship though, they found that the entire crew was indeed dead. Their bodies were scattered around the ship. Their faces were frozen in expressions of pure terror, and their arms were reaching out like they'd been trying to fight something off. There were no signs of physical injuries, though. The rescuers didn't have much time to figure things out, either. Shortly after they arrived, a fire broke out in the ship's cargo hold. They had to abandon the vessel, which then exploded, sinking into the depths of the ocean. And another one of the most mysterious maritime tales in history is, of course, the case of the Mary Celeste. On December 4th of 1872, a ship called the Mary Celeste was found floating in the Atlantic Ocean. It was found completely empty of people, anyway. All the cargo, the food supplies, and the crew's belongings, they were all still in place. All that was missing was a single lifeboat. The Mary Celeste had left New York about a month earlier, led by Captain Benjamin Briggs. He was traveling with his wife, his young daughter, and seven crew. The ship was headed for Italy. Now, everything seemed normal during the journey, and that's because we have the log entries. The last entry in the logbook, too, was just a regular note about the ship's position and weather. There were no clues in these logs about any sign of trouble. There was no sign of a struggle or any kind of damage to the ship. It looked like everyone had just calmly left in the lifeboat, but why? The weather was fine, the ship was in good shape. It was unlikely that pirates had attacked either, because again, nothing had been stolen and there were no signs of violence. To this day, nobody knows what happened to Captain Briggs, his family, or the crew. With all that said, I've been your host, James, and I'll catch you, yes, you specifically, in the next video.